I'm Brian Wansink. I'm director of the Cornell Food and Brand Lab and professor there. I'm also the author of uh, Mindless Eating, Why We Eat More Than We Think, and the book Marketing Nutrition. Here's what we do. All sorts of studies on what makes us eat what we do, but that we're unconscious of. In this little room right here, which is about 10% of what the entire lab is, we can really carefully control things. Because we can observe what's going on through these one-way mirrors that are right here. We can observe what's going on from a distance through the hidden cameras that you see up there at the side. We can control what goes on here by having a confederate in here who is part of this, who people believe is part of the study, but who isn't, who's just an observer and is doing a specific thing to see how it influences what you're doing. On some of our earlier research, we've done some things that show that, that children who help mom and dad cook a meal, even if they're only four years old, end up being, end up experiencing a meal that, compared to their counterparts, has them more likely to drink milk and less likely to drink juice and soda pop. It's more likely to get them to eat a salad. It's more likely to get them to eat an extra vegetable entree, or a vegetable side dish, rather. But it's also more likely to get them to eat more desserts. And that's simply by getting them involved in the meal. We find that if you do it after the meal, for instance, if you have them clean up, instead of helping prepare the meal, it has almost none of those effects. Well, we're here in another part of the Cornell Food and Brand Lab. And this is the part that looks more like a living room because this is where we study things like comfort foods. Now, if you talk to a lot of people, they believe that comfort foods are good and they're bad. They believe that they're good in terms of what they do for a person, but they tend to kind of paint them as a really negative, non-nutritious food. What we found over and over again is that about 60% of the foods that people do eat for comfort are maybe the ones that are a little less nutritious. They're the chocolate lava cake, they're the ice cream, they're the chips and things like this. But interestingly, a little over 40% of the foods that people have as their primary comfort food are actually quite nutritious. They're the, they're the steaks, hamburgers, pasta, soup, salads in some case, vegetables, cooked vegetables in many cases. One of the things we find is that if you, uh, the difference, primary difference between men and women is that when it comes to comfort foods, is that women tend to migrate a little bit more toward the less nutritious comfort foods, whereas guys tend to migrate more toward the more nutritious comfort foods. And when you ask a, a woman, well, don't you get a lot of comfort when you, you know, eat the steak and pasta and soups and things like this that men say make them feel cared for? Women will say, what I associate with those foods is either me having to make them or clean up after them, or my mother having to do that. And that's not comforting. The top comfort foods that women claim um, are their comfort foods. They tend to be very convenient foods. They tend to be things you can eat out of a box like ice cream or things you can open in a bag like cookies or chips or candy. The majority of people believe that comfort foods end up being eaten when they're in the dumps. That's not true. It's not true at all. In fact, one of the things that we describe in, in the book Mindless Eating end up being a bunch of the situations in which people consume comfort foods and why they end up doing it. But one takeaway ends up being that um, if you look at the last instance that most people ate a comfort food, for the majority of people in North America, that instance was likely to be a celebratory occasion. Or whether it be they're out with a friend who they really like and hadn't seen for a while, or whether it be they had had a great day at work and wanted to spoil themselves. Now that ends up being, in about 73% of all cases, the times when people end up turning to comfort foods. In a celebratory mood, the comfort foods they'll go to will be the ones that are a little bit more healthy in some cases, but they'll also be the ones that are likely to be a little less familiar. When people are really down in the dumps, they'll end up eating the foods they eat most often. It won't even be a different type of soup. It'll be their favorite type of soup. One of the studies that, that I talk about in, in the book, Mindless Eating, ends up looking at 
how a company could go about, uh, this is a soy company, could go about making its product more of a comfort food to people. Because soy isn't something that's generally liked by a lot of people. And, and we did this in, in one case by uh, associating, by, by having it being served in ways that, that, that's associated and position it with, with happy experiences at the dinner table. And we did this by altering the packaging so that there were fun things that could be talked about and um, discussed and done while somebody was eating this food. And if that ends up being done enough times, it ends up becoming, it ends up taking on the associations that are more consistent with comfort foods than they are another thing for dinner. What we did in this case was we ended up changing some games, we gave them some little things they could do, some family games that they could do during the meal that that really as a, as a secondary element had anything to do with soy nutrition at all, but they were just something that made that family meal different and more special. I think there's an ongoing trend that's, that's tremendously overlooked and it's the trend toward mindless eating. There's all these cues around us that cause us to eat a whole lot more than we think. Um, how much is the right amount of pasta to serve yourself? I don't know, it's however much looks normal. Well, in a large plate, um, if you put three ounces of pasta on a, on a tennis plate, for instance, which is a medium-sized plate, it looks like a full amount. I mean, that, that fills the plate. But you put three ounces on a 12-inch plate, you know, it doesn't even look like an appetizer. You know, barely covers the middle of it. So what do you do? Typically, you serve yourself about 28% more on a larger plate, which means if you were to downsize back down to that tennis plate, you're going to serve a lot less. In fact. It's 22% less once you go from bigger amount to smaller amount. 22% less is, is 200 calories. Doing that every day for a full year is going to lead a person to weigh 22 pounds less in a year than they otherwise would. We've been working with uh, the restaurant industry trying to tell them to use smaller plates. Use smaller plates is an all-you-can-eat place. People take less and our research shows they, they end up eating less. Now, which one of these has more? They both have exactly two ounces in them. If you're like most people, and if you're even like expert Philadelphia bartenders, you would believe that this glass, the tall skinny glass, held more than the short wide glass. So what would you do? You'd pour more in the short wide glass. In fact, what we find is experienced bartenders with five or more years of experience still end up pouring about 28 to 32 percent more in these short wide glasses. Why? Well, it's the visual illusion. It's like very many of the visual illusions we talk about in mindless eating. It's the idea that we look at a height of a glass instead of the width of the glass. Even when we showed the bartenders that they poured 32 percent more into a short wide glass, they didn't believe it. So we'd say, okay, try it again. And invariably what would happen is they'd still end up pouring about 28% more in that short white right glass, even though we just showed them how biased they are. That is how powerful this is. You cannot remind yourself to pour less in a short white right glass than you might otherwise do, because you are <laughs> hardwired to do this. One of the things we know is that if there's a big variety of food, you're more likely to take a lot more. But it's not just having all these options that cause us to eat more. Simply believing that there's more variety also leads us to eat more. In this little demonstration right here, we would find that people would be much more likely to take a lot more if we gave them these dual colors than if we gave them either of the two colors singly. Now all of them taste alike, but what we find is you give people nine different colors of M&Ms in a big bowl, they end up eating about twice as many. The more variety there is, the more you believe it's going to be fun and exciting to eat that product. The more fun and exciting you think it is to eat that product, the more you end up eating. If you want to have a great party and make people think you're having a, a really huge variety of food, simply take the three items you're going to have as appetizers or that you're going to have as, a, let's say, party appetizers. Instead of having them in three bowls, break them into six bowls. What people do is they believe there's a lot more variety at the party, even though there's still just three different things. If they believe there's a lot more variety, the bad news is, unfortunately, they end up eating about 14% more food. The problem with a lot of beverages, particularly wine, where what happens is that people, the majority of wine drinkers, 
have a very crude understanding of wine. You can give them a Merlot grape or a Cab grape or Syrah grape, and it is a small percentage of people that could pick which of those three it was. And that's what makes people so suggestible when it comes to wine. How do most people buy wine when they're, when they're going to go to a dinner party? They, they go to a wine store, they might know whether they want red or white, and then they basically look for the prettiest label between $15 and $20. You know, and in reality, that's a tremendous strategy. Because as we found, your expectations of what something's going to taste like have an almost hardwired impact on what they do taste like. What the economy is influencing is probably less areas of food than it is other areas. And I don't think it's going to have that as much of an impact on people as we think. Where there's an incredible opportunity, though, is to use this to try to nudge consumers into the home. Maybe one more meal a week. Just one more meal a week and try to cook at home. Oftentimes people say, well, gee, isn't the, the, the best, most nutritious food uh, um, most expensive? Well, you know, an opportunity here is to get people to eat more fruits and vegetables by realizing that they don't need to be fresh fruits and vegetables. Well, why do they need to be fresh? In fact, we find shortly after vegetables are, are, are picked, they end up denigrating in, in, in some of the qualities that, that make them so nutritious. That doesn't happen with things that are flash frozen and doesn't happen with things that are canned. They maintain sort of, you could call it the nutritional integrity for much longer life. I think that there's, there's three groups of consumers. There's what I call the nutrition vigilant consumers, there's the nutrition predisposed consumers, and the third group is the group that's pretty much resigned to it being too much of a hassle, being too difficult. Now that, that top group, they may be a, an okay market, they're not a big market, they may be a decent market, but they're not, that's not how we're going to make the world healthier is by aiming at those people. It's that middle group of people, the people who are the nutrition predisposed, but who just don't know how to do it. <laughs> that is where the incredible advantage lies. Because if we, can, if we can influence them, we also influence their kids. Or if we can influence them as a child, we can also influence the parents. That's where the action lies. But the action doesn't lie in telling them, eat more fruits and vegetables. Because if anything, 50 years of nutrition research has shown us that that doesn't work. What we need to do is make it as easy for them as possible. That's what the 100 calorie pack's done, and that's where the future lies. When I was executive director for the Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion at the USDA, one of the things that I had talked with the secretary about was about starting something called the Small Change Movement. The whole idea was moving away from trying to convince people to make wholesale changes in their entire life, but instead moving them in the direction of simply making one small change. I wrote up a charter for a counterpart to what's the President's Council for Physical Fitness and Sports, and this would be the President's Council for Family Nutrition. I wrote up that charter, and that's been passed on passed on up to the White House, and that is something that I think can have an incredible impact because what it does is it raises to the top the power of the nutritional gatekeeper. It raises to the top the notion that he or she controls 72 percent of what their family eats. Their hands aren't tied. This isn't something we point to the schools and blame them, or point to the food industry and blame them, or point to fast foods and blame them. No, this is something that can start right with consumers and families tonight. We don't have to wait past dinner time tonight to get things going in the right direction.